Welcome to Lessons for Life, where we seek to learn, love, and live the Word of God. Now, here is James Long, Jr. Good morning. Uh, So the last couple of weeks, I've been starting with a verse from Proverbs chapter 4. And the verse goes this way, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. A little bit later on in the passage, it goes this way. It says in verse 24, put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and gaze, be straight before you, ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. So this morning, I get an opportunity to uh, talk to you about the topic of um, peacemaking. Uh, The first week, we got an opportunity to talk about the idea of getting to the heart and understanding that it's out of our hearts, lives, um, our lives speak. Uh, Last week, we talked about communication and healthy communication in the family and in relationships. And today, I'm going to be asking you to work along with me in making some commitments to peacemaking and reconciliation. Um, I don't know if you know, but uh, there are three pastors, and then we have a total of six elders here. Um, And the pastors are bivocational, so we have jobs outside of here as well as here. And one of my jobs outside of here is a counseling. I'm a biblical counselor. I've got a counseling practice uh, in the next town. And I can tell you, I love my job. I love to preach. I love to teach Sunday school. I love the opportunity to disciple and counsel people. I love my job. I really do. Um, But I don't have a job, and we don't have a job if it's not because of the um, problems that humanity has. Um, Humanity struggles deeply with problems in relationships, individually, relationally, um, in so many ways. I love the opportunity of having a gospel-centered ministry. You know, it's about Christ and his cross. It's Christ-centered. It's cross-centered. It's spirit-enabled. It is God-glorifying. It is such an enjoyment. My job and our jobs as pastors and elders is to make disciples. That's what our job is. And, And a disciple is one, as we've been trying to talk about over these last couple of weeks, it's somebody that has the character but also the conduct of the Lord Jesus Christ, an attitude and the actions of the Lord Jesus Christ, the beliefs and the behaviors. It's not just simply the external things that you do. It's about what's happening deep in your heart. There's a process to making disciples as well. Discipleship is a process. It takes time. The whole element of discipleship is about growth and change, that you're going to be different as you move forward in life. It's a, it's a lifelong journey. We don't finish that until we see Christ face to face, whether him coming back to get us um, through death or he coming back and rescuing all of us that have trusted in him. So discipleship is becoming like Christ. Discipleship, I will tell you this morning, is about obedience. There are some of us that, very honestly, know what the Word says about how to relate with one another, but we choose not to do it. This morning, I'm going to be asking you to make a commitment to obey God's Word when, a call, when He calls you to be a seeker of peace and a seeker of reconciliation in life. One author put it this way, that discipleship is like a boot camp to train people for the front lines. That here you come into this congregation of believers and hopefully you're built up and then you go out into the world to share the good news of the gospel in and through your life. So why do we need discipleship? Why do we need counseling? We need discipleship and counseling because we are broken people. We live in a fallen world. Uh, Weeks ago, Pastor Doug was talking about how life was in the garden. You remember in the garden before sin and how Adam and Eve were in this communion with one another. There was a harmony between humanity and God. There was a harmony between humanity and nature. There was a harmony between humanity and humanity. But then all changed at the fall. And the fall changed things. If you remember three weeks ago, I asked you to remember three questions that were essential. Why do I do the things that I do? That's essential. Most people believe that the things that they do are because of other people from their past or people in their present. Their environment is causing them to react the way they are. 
What I have asked you to consider is what Jesus' viewpoint was radically different. Jesus' radical viewpoint was this. In Luke 6, he said, it is out of the treasure of your heart you speak and you live. It's what's happening within you that is causing the things that happen and pour out of your life. That was the first question. Why do I do what I do? But then the second question was this. How does lasting change take place? Lasting change takes place in the fact that I I change from the inside out. It's not about changing my environment. It's not about changing the people around me. It's not about avoiding people. It is about changing internally by the work of the Spirit, living according to his word for the glory and honor of his Son. That if God can reconcile us to himself in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be reconciled with one another. And then the third question, why do... Uh, Why do I do the things that I do? How does lasting change take place? And then the third one was this. How can I be an instrument in the hands of God to minister grace to others? How can you be used by God to minister grace to your spouse or to your children or to your friends or your neighbors or people here in the congregation? So discipleship is needed. I've asked you to consider what your greatest problem is. You've heard that from Pastor Doug in the first four weeks. Our greatest problem is not outside of us. Our greatest problem is within us. It's sin. I want you to think about this, that sin disturbs every relationship that ever exists. Three realms. Sin distorts humanity and God. That every person born in this world is born separated from God because of sin that is in their lives. They haven't even done anything yet, but they've been born separated from God. And then we act out in sin because of the nature that is there within us. So every person in humanity has been separated from God and sin disturbs that. Sin not only disturbs the relationship between humanity and God, sin separates humanity and nature. I talked about the the bear that kind of walks around in my backyard, probably a bunch of them. I don't go up and pet a bear because I don't feel comfortable petting a bear. Lions and lambs don't lay down together this time right now because humanity and nature are at odds today because of humanity's sin. Sin has disturbed humanity and humanity, humanity and God, humanity and nature, but sin also disturbs humanity and humanity. That, that you remember when Adam and Eve were together, they were just one. And then all of a sudden, after they ate that fruit, there was a separation. They covered themselves up. They hid from God. They blamed one another. This attack was a byproduct of sin. Sin attacks everyone at birth, every single one of us. It degrades, it debases, it destroys. Every broken marriage, every disrupted home, Every shattered friendship is a byproduct of sin today. The one thing I need you to recognize is this. We can't ignore it. We can't gloss over it. We can't just label it something else. We have to deal with sin in the only way that God has given us, through the person and the work of the Jesus Christ. Sin is deep. It's not just the things that I do outside. It goes down to the very heart of who I am. Sin is so stinking deceptive. I think I've got it right, but my life, I, it's like I think I see it clearly, but it deceives me. And then sin is destructive. It will destroy your relationships. It will destroy even you. We need to go on the attack against sin. How do I do that? See, our our problem is is more than just moral corruption, which we have, and guilt and condemnation and alienation. What God wants to give you in Christ is a new nature. What God wants to give you in Christ is forgiveness. What God wants to give you in Christ is reconciliation. What God wants to give you in Christ is a standing before him that you are accepted before him. He did that in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He has justified us by his amazing grace. Doug was just talking about that, justified by his grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The only way that we're ever going to be able to make a commitment to peacemaking reconciliation is to recognize that we've got a problem. And the problem is me. And the problem is you. So I want you to consider this morning that our tendency is to protect ourselves when it comes to relational difficulties. I know you do it. I got one finger out, three fingers point back. You protect yourself, so do I. Our natural inclination. We tend to promote ourselves, right? 
We tend to believe that I am good and that other person is wrong. We, we focus outward. We protect ourselves. We promote ourselves. And what we do is we punish other people. And what God says he wants to do in your life and through your life is he wants to show the love of Christ. See, this body of believers should be so in love with Christ, inflamed by Christ, and it should be coming out of our marriages, out of our families, out of our homes, out of this church for the glory of God so that the world outside sees something radically different. But it doesn't happen that way. See, the broken relationships we have are distracting, they're destructive, and they distort the message of the gospel. We say we believe the gospel, but then we do not forgive one another. We say we believe the gospel, but we do not pursue one another in reconciliation. And there is something ungodly about it. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I know, and one of the reasons I love my job, is I get to see people who are broken and relationships restored. I get to see people come into my office who have never known Christ, and they walk out of my office saved by the gospel grace. I get to see marriages that should never be reconciled and though God does amazingly is brings these two people and humbles them and transforms them. The gospel is powerful. Christ is significant. He is sufficient to, to transform any struggle. If the greatest problem we had was separation between God and us and God dealt with that in the person and work of Christ, can't he help you? Restore peace and find reconciliation in your life? He absolutely can. So I want to talk to you this morning about a pattern that tends to happen in our lives. One of the patterns that I think happens is found in this diagram. Stay with me with it. Because some of you may be on this path of bitterness in your life. It starts with you see a wounded spirit. You have felt hurt. Proverbs 18, 14 says this, a wounded spirit who can bear it. See, the first step in separation in relationships is this, that you've been wounded. And I've got to tell you, this side of heaven, you're going to be wounded. (laughs) If you are in a relationship with anybody else, people are going to harm you. They're going to hurt you. When you open yourself up to somebody, you will be wounded. That's just a byproduct of sin. I will hurt people. I will be hurt by people. So so there's nothing I can do this side of heaven to avoid being hurt by others. What I can do this side of heaven is to try to deal with my life in such a way that I don't hurt people as often as I do. And that when they hurt me, that what are the steps I need to take in order to honor God? So some of you are in a wounded spirit. You've been hurt You've been violated, and now emotionally and mentally, you are producing that hurt in your heart, and that you've been wounded, and it's germinating within you. One author in his really good book, The Heart of Anger, Lou Priolo, talked about the second step, bitterness. He said this, if we do not respond biblically to the hurt, this would mean forgiving the sin or overlooking the sin or realizing the offense was not wrong, you will begin to rehearse the events in your mind over and over. I talk about taking a mint with my clients, and if you were to take a mint and put it into your mouth, you roll that around in your mouth, and eventually it will dissolve. That's what exactly what we do with our thoughts. The hurt that somebody has done to you, you roll that around over and over again, and it leads to bitterness. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, a root of bitterness will defile many. The dilemma is this, that if I continue to roll your sin around in my mind, I am forsaking 1 Corinthians 13 that says, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Some of you have been at a place where you have been wounded, and now you've gone to bitterness, and then you go to the next step, anger. And anger here is not just a simple expose, explosion of emotion, which can happen, but this anger is more of a characteristic quality of your life. You start to develop an angry personality. The Bible even tells us don't even associate with that type of person. Some of you with your anger go outward. Some of your anger stems and goes inward. But the reality is this, that there's anger that is happening. I've been wounded. I am bitter. I am angry 
And then the next step is stubbornness. Insubordination. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, it says this, rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry, which is interesting. Iniquity in the fact that it is sinful, idolatry is in the fact that I believe that there's something that I need that's going to satisfy me more than God. The Bible actually gives an illustration of this stubbornness like a, a heifer that has dug its heels in and the master's trying to pull this heifer and it's dug its heels in, I'm not moving. Is that any of you in this room? Has it been any of you in your relationships? And the reality is this, that if you are at this place of stubbornness, you have not only committed iniquity, sins, but there's some idol that is there in your heart and your life that is hindering peace and reconciliation. So some of you have gone down the path of woundedness, and now you've got bitterness. And then there's a character or quality of anger in your life. And from there, you have dug your heels in. I'm not bending. And then you go to out-and-out rebellion. I don't even care what God says. I don't care what James or Tim or Doug say. I'm not going to do it. And now what you do is you rebel. Because you have magnified the horizontal issue and minimized the glory of God in your life. I got one finger out, three fingers point back because I've been on this path, my brothers and sisters, and I'm telling you, there is absolutely no freedom. There is no healing. There is no hope on this path. None at all. I want you to realize this. One author put it this way. Today's reactions become tomorrow's habits. Today's choices become tomorrow's influences. Today's anger becomes tomorrow's bitterness. Today's thoughts become tomorrow's beliefs. Today's desires become tomorrow's idols. So our problem is here. Some of you are on this path. There is a biblical path out. And what I'm going to ask you to do today is to make a series of commitments with me. See, the biblical problem offers biblical hope. Turn with me to James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, a series of passages I want to grab, I want to look at today. We're going to just read them, look through the passages, and then what I want to do at the end is make some commitments. I want you to make some commitments with me. James chapter 4. It's a warning. James is writing to his readers, and he's saying, I'm warning you against worldliness. That we're living like the world. If our marriages are ending in divorce the same rate as the world, if we're we're acting like the world, what makes a difference in the gospel in your lives? It should be different. There should be different. So James chapter 4, what causes the quarrels and the fights among you? Listen to this. Is it not this, that your passions are at war where? Within you. See, we tend to think that the arguments and the fights are because of what's happening around me. No. No, my brothers and sisters, the reason why I quarrel and fight is because there's something wrong within me. You desire, that means covet, and do not have. So you murder. I've never murdered anyone, James. James was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I think he's thinking back to the Sermon on the Mount. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, if you have such anger in your hearts, you've murdered them. If you lust in your hearts, you've committed adultery. What ends up happening is that the things that are happening deep within are going to come out, even if you don't show it externally, the heart issue is there. So you've murdered You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You don't go to God and pray. And when you do ask, you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So sometimes we do pray, and it's like, God, change him or change her. And it's wrong attitude. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity to God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, that God wants to rule in your life. He wants to be the king of your life, your satisfying force in your life. But God gives more grace. 
Because James, I can't possibly forgive my spouse. I can't possibly forgive my parent. I can't possibly forgive this person. God gives more grace. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves to God and he will flee from, I'm sorry, submit yourselves to God and he, uh, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, that's external change, you sinners. Purify your hearts, that's internal change, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Can you imagine what would happen if I start to look and say about my own sin? Forget about Amy or Abby or Hannah or Isaiah, my family, my sin. How do I sin as a husband, as a father, as a friend? And you look at those things in my life and I work to honor God and live by his grace for his glory. This passage seems to give the impression that there are going to be conflicts with others, that you're even at conflict with yourself, and that you're going to be a conflict with God. See, you may think that the problem is him or her, but the reality is there's something happening within you that needs to change. Jump back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because if we are a conflict with one another, and we are a conflict within, and we are a conflict with God, how does that get dealt with? I love this passage. This is like a, a counseling passage, discipleship passage. Oh, this is a great passage. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. For the love of Christ, not my bitterness, not my anger, not my rehearsing your sin, the love of Christ controls me. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he, Christ, has died for all, that those who live no longer for themselves, but for him who for their sakes died and was raised to life. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him less, lo- less no longer. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. And all this was from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So if God can reconcile you to him through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, how is it that I cannot seek reconciliation horizontally? One more passage I want you to consider. In John chapter 13. On the night that Jesus Christ was betrayed. You remember he had just washed the disciples' feet. He even washed Judas' feet, which amazes me. Your spouse can't be Judas, right? Maybe you feel that they are, but they're not. They're not Judas. But the Lord Jesus Christ, the sovereign God, got down on his hands and knees and he washed the feet of the man that was going to betray him. And he loved on Judas. He treated him with value and honor, but then Judas went out the door to betray him. And then you remember this passage in verse 34 of chapter 13. A new commandment I give to you. What's the commandment? That you love one another, just as I've loved you. You are to love one another. But look at verse 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you do what? If you love one another. 
There is a reality that happens in our lives that if we are seeking of peace and seeking of reconciliation in our lives and we are recognizing that there's a conflict within, a conflict with God, and that's producing the conflict with others, and that God has reconciled me to himself in Christ and he's given me the opportunity for a ministry of reconciliation and that God has given me an opportunity to be able to love you and that's going to be a gospel witness to the world. That is an amazing opportunity that God has given you and me today to show gospel grace. You live an evangelistic life just by how you live today. So what's our problem? Our greatest problem is sin. What's your hope? Your hope is if God can reconcile you to himself in Christ, he can help reconciliation in your marriage, in your family, with your friends. But how do we do it? Biblical change. And these are the commitments I'm going to be asking you to make. I'm going to give you a series of commitments I'm going to look, ask you to look at. I'm going to give you a biblical reference behind it. I'm going to ask you to evaluate in your own life how well are you doing. These um, commitments came from a ministry called Peacemaker Ministries. Um, and uh, they've made a ministry of trying to find peace and reconciliation in relationships. I use it in my counseling ministry. I would encourage you um, to evaluate your life. So, so God has created us to be peacemakers. And the reality is this. It should be our desire to have a culture of peace here. That your home should be a culture of peace that magnifies Christ, magnifies his grace. See, as we stand in light of the cross, we realize that any bitterness, unforgiveness, broken relationships are not appropriate for the people of God. It's not. See, if God can reconcile us to himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be seeking reconciliation with others. So I'm going to ask you to make these commitments. Commitment number one. The first one you will see is this. Whenever we are faced with a conflict, our primary goal will be to glorify God in our thoughts, words, and actions. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it said this. 1 Corinthians 10, it says, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, that includes your thoughts, words, and actions, do it to the glory of God. When you go into a conflict with somebody, is your primary aim the glory of God in the way you think? Is it your aim in the way you speak? Is it your aim in how you live that God would be pleased with how I'm handling you today? Commitment number one, I ask you, how well are you doing at this? Commitment number two, we will try to get the logs out of our own eye before we focus on what others may have done wrong. Oh boy, this is hard. You remember this, this is Matthew chapter seven and Jesus says, do not judge. That's the verse that all the world knows, right? But they don't get the context. Do not judge lest you be judged. In the way you judge, you will be judged and the measure you use will be measured against you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust that's in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the two by four sticking out of your own? First, deal with the two by four in your own eye. All right, James Long paraphrase. And then you will be able to deal with the speck that's in your own eye. Well, James, you don't know my husband. I don't have a log. He's got the log. I got the speck. Gotcha. I gotcha. But when I get a speck in my eye, I can't see any way anywhere, Right? So deal with the speck or the log or whatever you would want to call it. Uh, deal with what obscures your vision. And then go and help your brother in a way of grace. Commitment number three. We will seek to overlook minor offenses. How well do you do at this? We have a tendency to magnify these offenses. And the smallest offense we get into arguments over um, Jay Adams has this diagram and it's got this arrow going to a problem, the big problem, and then there's a little problem over here and we keep attacking the smaller problems instead of dealing with the central problem. I struggle with the fact that you don't respect me. I struggle with the fact that you're not showing love to me. Deal with the central problem instead of those little surface garbage things. Overlook those things to deal with the major issues. Get to the root of the issue in life. Proverbs 19.11 says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Commitment number four. 
We will seek to refrain from all gossip, backbiting, backbiting and slander. And if we have a problem with a person, we intend to talk to them and not about them. Oh, we got a problem with this one too because we tend to talk about other people, right? <laughs> it's sometimes fun, right? It really isn't. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, verse 29, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building up as it fits the occasion and may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God whom you were sealed in the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and slant, clander and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Commitment number five. We will endeavor to make charitable judgments towards one another believing the best until we have facts to prove otherwise. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, it says this, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Some of us already judge a person, and we've been talking about over these last couple of weeks, I can't even know my own heart, let alone yours. But for some reason, I judge myself pure and judge you sinful. I need to judge myself sinful and offer grace to you. Offer the charitable judgments. How well do you do with this one? Commitment number six. If an offense is too serious to overlook, and some of them are, don't misunderstand me, some of them are, or if we think that someone has something against us, we will seek reconciliation without what? Without delay. In Matthew chapter 5, it talks about you're in a worship service. And in that worship service, you have your offering. And you're going to bring your offering. And, and God says, he brings taps on your heart about the fact that there is someone that has something against you. And what are you supposed to do biblically? Leave that service. Forget about giving your altar offer. Go, be reconciled, and then come back and do your offering. Why? Because God is so passionate about reconciliation of relationships that he is saying that even part of the worship service, the greatest form of worship that you can do is to show that you love and forgive one another. All right, so that's if I am the offender. What happens if they are the offender? I'm not off the hook. Matthew 18 says this. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. See, if I am the offender or the offended, I am called to initiate reconciliation. I am never called to avoid. I'm never called to give you back or stonewall you, ever. I'm called to pursue peace. Commitment number seven. When we offer a word of correction to others, we will do so graciously and gently with the goal of serving and restoring them rather than beating them down. Some of us are wired to be law type people and we really know the Bible and we're law, justice. And some of us are kind of wired to be grace and kindness. The Bible doesn't say either one is wrong. What God says is that you need to have both. Jesus Christ was a man full of grace and truth. You need to speak truth in love. There needs to be a balance in your life. So there are times that I need to confront my brothers or sisters about areas in their lives. You need to confront your spouse about areas or your son or your daughter about areas in their lives. Absolutely, but it needs to be done not to beat them down. Proverbs twelve eighteen says, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrust, but the, th the tongue of the wise brings healing. In Galatians chapter six, it says this, brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Commitment number eight. When someone tries to correct us, we will ask God's help to resist prideful defensiveness and welcome the correction with humility. Welcome that correction with humility. In Psalm 141, I love this verse. It says this, verse five. Let a righteous man strike me 
it is kindness. Hear that? When a righteous man strikes me, it is kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse that oil. Yet my prayer is continually against the evil deeds. So, so he's saying that, you know what? Some of my brothers are going to wound me at times because I'm wrong and they wound me, but that's good. I don't want to be beaten up by somebody that doesn't love me. I want to be encouraged by the one who does. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 32, it says, whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. Some of us shut our ears to other people that are being used by God in our lives to tell us that we're off course and it's wrong. Commitment number nine. As we seek to resolve differences with others, we will look out for their concerns and interests as well as our own. See, I'm resolving this difficulty with me, with you, but I want to do this in a way that's going to honor you and that's going to respect me. Philippians 2 said this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count one another's more significant than yourselves. Let each of us look only to our own interests, but also to the interest of others. See, when we resolve conflicts with people, we have a tendency to make it about us. We need to make it about us, us, both of us, you and me. I want your interest. I want my interest. I'll give you one more commitment number 10. When others repent, we will ask God to give us the grace to forgive them freely and fully as God has forgiven us so that we may glorify his reconciling grace. Be kind and tender-hearted. Forgive one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. How'd you do with those commitments? How did you do as you look at those areas of your life? So let me bring this home. I believe God pursued you. The Bible tells us that we didn't seek him, he sought us. He didn't choose, we didn't choose him, he chose us. He pursued us. The greatest offended one, there was no one more offended than God, and God left heaven to come and rescue you. He pursues you. I'm asking you to pursue one another. Jesus Christ purchased you by his blood. It's funny that in Ephesians, Paul said, husbands, love your wife as what? Christ loved the church and gave himself. We need to give ourselves. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. God pursued you. God purchased you. God pardoned you. There is not a sin, if you are in Christ, that God has not forgiven. You are forgiven and free. And how is it, if you read in Matthew 18, how is it that I've been forgiven the greatest debt, but my brother or sister has this small debt against me, and I want to punish them? I've missed out on the greatest issue. That if God pursued me and God purchased me and God pardoned me and God is pleased with you. Not because of what you do, because some of the things we do are pretty sinful. And we looked at those 10 things. I know a number of you said, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. But God still is pleased with you because of Christ. He has placed his righteousness on your account. And then what he's done is he's empowered you by Christ, by his Holy Spirit to live out. Oh, God pursued you, God purchased you, God pardoned you, God is pleased with you, and God wants to powerfully work in and through your life to display his glory through the world. Let him do that in your marriage. Let him do that in your family. Let him do that, kids to parents. Let him do that to persons in this congregation that are separated from one another. Let him do that so that God will be displayed in this world for the glory and honor of his name. So how do I bring it home? I don't know. I'm gonna, we've been having the elders come forward at the end of a service. Maybe 
Some of you know right now that you have some struggle right now that you need to just be praying for. And you want your elders to pray over you. We want to be down here, down front to talk to you and communicate with you. Some of you, that we're going to be doing a um, resolving everyday conflicts um, workshop in the next couple of weeks or months. There's a sign-up sheet outside on the connection table. If you're interested in that, go out there and sign up and just tell me that you're interested in being part of that group. It's only eight weeks. It's a powerful series. Some of you know right now that there's somebody in your heart that you need to make it right with. You know, I did this seminar a uh, couple years ago, and one of the coolest things in the seminar was a Friday and Saturday on uh, resolving conflict. And at the lunch break on Saturday, this woman was so convicted about what was going on in her heart, she left that seminar, and she went and drove to her friend's house, which she had not talked to in years, and they reconciled. And she came back and gave a testimony about how God had convicted her and how God had transformed her and how God had reconciled that relationship. Oh, man, the glory goes to God. So maybe some of you today know you need to go and make it right with your spouse or your child or your friend. Or perhaps today you're one and we talk about gospel grace. Maybe you're sitting here today and you've never trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior. Some of this seems foreign. And you sit there and say, I don't do any of those things up there. God can't possibly forgive me. And the beauty of the gospel is this, that God can take the worst of sinners and bring us to faith in his son. Today, will you make a commitment to me, with me to be peacemakers, reconcilers for the glory of God and the good of his name. Lord, we praise you and thank you. I do love my job, God. <laughs> I love this job. It's not even a job. It's an adventure. <laughs> What's the adventure, Lord? Because I really don't ever know where you're going to take these people. I am merely used as an instrument in people's hands. And I could look out into this congregation. I know there's so many people that have been used as instrument in other people's hands as well. In your hands, in other people's lives, I should say. I thank you for the fact that not a pastor, not a counselor, not an elder changes another person. It is your Holy Spirit that transforms human hearts. So Lord, today I pray, I pray that through my words, I pray my words have been clear. I pray my words have been honoring to you. And if the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, I pray that they've been pleasing. And Lord, if there was anything that was shared today that has convicted a person here, I pray that they wouldn't run from that conviction. It's the worst thing they can do. The longer they put off this reconciliation, they're probably just going to let it go by. I pray that they would pursue peace today. Thank you for the fact that you pursued us, Lord, Thank you for the fact that you purchased us, Lord Jesus Christ, with your precious blood. Thank you for the fact that you are pleased with us, God the Father, because of the work of the Son. And thank you, for, thank you for the fact that you are looking to work powerfully in and through our lives. Help us to know that we love you and help the world to know that we are Christians by our love. And all God's people said, amen. This has been Lessons for Life with James Long, Jr. We hope you've been blessed. For more information, go to jameslongjr.org.